Freedom means different things to different people. But we are not so much concerned with the myriad ideas of freedom which different people hold as we are with the meaning of freedom which God holds and embodies as a quality of the Godhead. Within the very heart of God and the nature of God, there is the living embodiment of the essence of immortal freedom. Mankind today like to think and dwell upon the concept of a form of liberty which is but license and in many cases licentiousness, the power to walk their own way which they term as freedom. This is in almost every case not freedom, but it is bondage to some human quality which will never in all eternity give us the gifts of true freedom or help us to realize the meaning of freedom. Freedom is a quality which God embodies but which we can embody and which when we do embody is one of the greatest blessings of life that any man could ever hope to obtain and to keep and to sustain forever. All of us have been beset at one time or another with the fondness of hope. We have hoped, all of us, in most cases I think, as a child to grow up to become a man or woman that could contribute something to the world and if not to the world at large, to our own family or to honor our reason for being and we have thought that perhaps when the days of school were finished that we would be able to go out into the world as a noble and clean wrestler in the affairs of men and to do something that would glorify God and our fellow men and help to lift the burdens from life. Now there are many who sit in the shadow of darkness to whom this vision has not come. They were brought up by parents and in circumstances where darkness surrounded them and they have not known not only the meaning of freedom but they have not known the meaning of existence at all. Life to them is but a series of ups and downs. They live in the elevator consciousness. Their consciousness is like a yo-yo. One minute it's down in the very depths and dregs of despair and when little gifts and graces which they term to be great are given to them and dispensed to them such as a glass of wine or a raise in salary or the meeting with an interesting person or some person that they expect to receive something from that will please them, they are lifted up and they are dependent upon circumstances for their happiness. God did not intend man to be tied to outer external circumstances for his happiness. God intended that within ourselves we should have a wellspring, the fountain of eternal youth, such as Ponce de Leon sought the mythical fountain of youth, that we should be able to have that fountain a living within ourselves, pouring out the waters of eternal happiness to ourselves because we are the master of our own destiny and are not dependent on some other person, place, condition, or thing to receive our happiness. So long as we depend upon other people and outer circumstances for our freedom and our happiness, we will have a bondage to the person that we expect to receive happiness from. Whether that is a wife, whether it is a child, whether it is a friend, whether it is our government, no matter what it is, so long as we are dwelling in the bondage of expectation and then that expectation is not forthcoming, we are not God-centered, we are not free, we do not have immortal life in manifestation in our world. The requirements of the hour are freedom from all persons, all places, all conditions, all circumstances and a turning over of our life to the great power of the Holy Spirit so that God can be glorified in his own way because the best gifts, the greatest joys are yet to come. You heard and you have read in the great poem which one of our poets spoke and I think it was Browning 
where he said that toward the latter part of a person's life that they could reach out in hope for the best of life that was yet to be, for which the first part of life was made. We must understand then that God has created us in love and that it is his great love that has, so to speak, overshadowed us from our first going forth into manifestation as a babe. It was God's love that sung to us as we were held in our mother's arms. It was God's love that awakened and quickened within us the expectation of joy as we realized that a bright and sunny day was about to appear and we could go out perhaps in the meadow and pick flowers. We were able to find happiness in the simple joys of life and in the fireside and in the home and in decency and honor. But today, what do we find in the land? We find the success cult that has taken over the world. We find people thinking that unless they can make their first million by the time they're 30 years old, that they have lost the meaning of existence. We find that people feel that they must in some way become involved with those of the opposite sex in order to find some specific attraction, which while it is good and holy and pure, if it is properly carried on, is certainly not intended to be a licentiousness of worldly lust-seeking and provocation of this individual and that. It is intended to be a marriage, an alchemical marriage, whereby the soul of man becomes wedded to his own divinity. And if we find a husband and wife who are not in bondage to one another, but are in attunement with their own divine presence, we find in that home the joy of true happiness and we find the great spiritual magnetism that draws the power of God from on high into that home. And through those people will come, if the procreative purposes are followed, lovely children that are truly in tune with the higher octaves of life. And so we can fulfill our purposes in this way also in some cases. Others choose the path of absolute devotion to God. They choose to be completely wedded to their divine self and therefore some people choose to follow the celibate pathway. All of these things are in perfect divine order because Saint Germain knows that there are waiting in the wings of the great stage of life any number of wonderful souls who are pleading entrance into this world and desire not to come into this world, as St. Germain has told us, through barmaids, through people who are involved in the travestic trappings of life, but they want to come in through godly parents that they can find in the home the first kindlings of the sacred fire and be raised in a spirit of divine grace, giving them a head start over those individuals who come in in the blackness of despair and the maelstroms of life. We must understand then that the meaning of freedom is whatever part of God and of life we have been able to externalize that is real. Life is real where I am, yes. But this means that life is real where God is. And if God is not active in your life as principle, as power, and you are not in tune with the consciousness that the ascended masters have and hold, you have lost out on the meaning of life. And the freedom that you think you have is really very unimportant in every way. Let us understand then that there are two phases of life that are important to us. There is the personal phase of life, which involves our own individual, and I say individual, personal attunement with God, and there is the conglomerate relationship of ourselves in the social world, and I'm not referencing society as much as I am our national purpose. The purpose of our nation, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. This is the purpose of life as envisioned by the great master Saint Germain, which is blazed upon the great seal of the United States as Novus Ordo Seclorum in the Latin terminology with the Great Pyramid showing at the top of the Great Pyramid the all-seeing eye of God. 
which is the encyclopedic eye that gazes in all directions by the mighty light rays of God, which his fingers reach out and touch all of creation from the center to the periphery of existence. This, then, is the reality of God that was to indicate to us all our nation's destiny, one nation under God, a pyramid of lives builded four square on decency, honor, justice, and purity, and also a pyramid of lives where each stone was cut out as the chief cornerstone symbolized by the Christ consciousness was laid first of all and every pyramid stone was also purified and made square and fitted into place in the perfect bonds of mystic masonry so that the great pyramid would come up to the apex which is the summit and at the summit of a man's existence he would be able to find his freedom in the great cosmic vision of Almighty God. God does not feel that there is any greater education that can be given to anyone as the education of the educated eye. The educated eye that is able to see behind the veil of human imperfection and enter into the Holy of Holies, the holy place where he can share with God the God's eye vision of the universe. And what kind of vision do you find today? One of the men in this room told me recently about an experience he had had in going to a concert with a friend who had a great deal of musical appreciation. And a great and famous singer was there. And this individual, mind you, went with him, who was a music critic, and he sat there through all of this beautiful concert by this professional artist, and then he turned, mind you, to this gentleman, and he said, did you see, did you hear that sour note? Did you hear that sour note? And this gentleman, who is orientated around spiritual things, said to him, well, I was too busy or something to this effect. I was interested in all of the beautiful notes that I heard. But this is the way today that the world is many times, and many of the people of the world, they are looking for the sour notes in creation. They are looking for the sour notes in their neighbor. They are looking for all of these things, but they do not have the God's eye vision, which is the beholder of perfection. And this, of course, was intended to be the foundation stone of America. It was true culture, where every man will be able to know his neighbor as a God-fearing individual and hold the vision for them that will raise them out of the socket, as Ahmad Chohan says in the forthcoming pearl, of mortal imperfection into the perfection of God. You must understand then that it's the God's eye vision that we must have and hold. It's an easy thing to fall into the pattern of the world and to go down into the dregs of mortal imperfection and say, oh, I see this gentleman over here and you know, He's lazy, and his wife is lazy too. All they want to do is sit home and watch television, or to look at another individual and say, oh, they never go to church, they're not interested in God. How do you know what your neighbor is interested in? Do you see his immortal soul? None of us know what our neighbor is interested in. You don't even know what your husband or wife is interested in. It takes the God's eye vision that will lift people out of this mortal imperfection and raise them into divine perfection but you have to hold it for them regardless of the appearances. People want to be able to see perfection. They all want it. They want it for themselves and they want it for others. But it requires the calling forth of perfection by the invocative process of the spiritual vision. The spiritual vision is alchemical. It has magnificent power. I can hold a vision of perfection for someone and draw them for miles across this city and they will come walking to this door and not even know how they got here because someone held a vision for them. Many people have had the vision held for them by their mother. This is what Abraham Lincoln knew about when he was prompted to say, all that I am and ever hope to be I owe to my angel mother because he knew that she held the vision of greatness for him. And this is something that your spiritual mother and your spiritual father are doing for you now and will never cease to do. It is only if you take all of the opportunities that life gives you and throw them away by saying, oh, 
I don't think there's anything to this religion. I don't think there's anything to these things. A lot of Christian people I know, or a lot of good people, are really hypocrites. I don't care to go to church anymore because I don't like to sit there with all these hypocrites. When you think that way and you feel that way, you are holding to the pattern of imperfection of mortal thought and feeling. And you certainly are not going to rise up. Stop looking at the sour notes. Look at the meaning of God freedom. And what is God freedom? It is the power to embrace the will of God for yourselves and for your nation. It doesn't matter if you were a communist living in Russia. If you could hold the vision for the Russian people of divine freedom, you would help that nation to obtain a greater measure of spiritual freedom in time. People think thoughts are not things. They think thoughts don't go out on wings, as Eller Wheeler Wilcox said. But they do, and your thoughts influence and mold the world. Every one of you people. Some of you people have a greater thought power than others. You know how to project it better than others. Some of you people actually could go out and project negativity as easy as pie. You could go ahead and get depressed and you could spread gloom everywhere you walked. But that's not why we're here. We're here to understand the meaning of God freedom. And God freedom is something so magnificent and so wonderful as for individuals to spend their lives in seeking. Now you know we were up today on the top of Cheyenne Mountain. And when we were up there, we walked in there and we noticed the terrible musty smell in this building, which they call a restaurant. And there were all these animal forms. They had St. Bernard dogs they used to use in the mountains, stuffed. They had moose and deer and all kinds of these human creations stuffed by taxidermists. And the odor was actually present in the atmosphere. This is the way people like to do, to preserve the sacred sanctity of their own little pets of consciousness. But as long as we cling on to those things, the mustiness of imperfection, we are going to forget the great message of the Christ. The message of the Christ is a living message, a new and living way, full of hope, full of joy, full of peace, full of compassion. But you can't tell by looking at everybody how far they can jump. You can't tell by looking at people what is inside of them. You may think you can. I have had people come from various parts of the world to visit me because they knew that I was one of the messengers of St. Germain of the Summit Lighthouse activity. One man came in and he said, Oh dear, he said, I expected to find an old gray-haired man with white hair about ready to pass on that would have all this hoary wisdom. And he said, I'm a little disappointed to find you as a young man or relatively young, you see. Well, this is the way the world has concepts about people. They think a certain voice that they hear on the radio or somewhere is going to belong to a certain face. And they're awfully surprised sometimes when they find the great big booming voice is actually housed in a little tiny body that's about five feet high. And then again, they're surprised to find some man six feet, five inches tall with a voice that can hardly speak up at all. People have all kinds of ideas that are wrong. And it's up to us now to get rid of those ideas and to find the meaning of our own personal freedom and find the meaning of our nation's freedom. Our nation is only made up of people like you and I. And what you think and say does count. Don't get the idea that it doesn't count, it does count. And if you get enough people thinking right, you can change all of the negative patterns of the world and you can raise the world out of its density, imperfection, sickness, fear, ideas of suicide, and all the ridiculous concepts that people have that cheapen life until life becomes worthwhile at any age. And when life is worthwhile at any age, it is because you have entered in to a consciousness of the newness of life in the real meaning of life, which you ought to have known from the first but didn't. This is not the fault of Almighty God. It's not the fault of the Ascended Masters. It's not the fault of hierarchy. Hierarchy is served through the ages. There have been only a few prophets in all ages that dared to tell the people the truth. And these prophets in times past were stoned. They were spit upon. They were sawn asunder. 
put up and strung up by the legs and the saw passed right through their body. You don't realize the horror of it today because at that time we lived in an area of terrible physical torture. Today this torture cycle has been changed till it is now psychological torture. And what you have today is the frustrations of the mechanical age. Therefore it is up to us to understand that we must be free from all that binds us by the power of Almighty God. And we can be. We are moving toward it all the time. But we are the ones who must accept it. We are the ones who must interpret freedom by acting and outpicturing freedom in our lives. It's one thing to stand up and say, I pledge allegiance to the flag. It's one thing to stand up and say, oh, I'm going to honor freedom. I'm going to give a little talk on freedom. I'm going to discuss what freedom is. But it's entirely another thing to go ahead and live freedom and understand freedom and assimilate it into your own life. Every one of you people are a potential Christ, a potential light in the world, a beacon of hope to many souls, if you will, and you can only make yourself available. And if you have to struggle, as some of the men in this audience are struggling to try to form a little group, and some of the women are trying to struggle to form a little group, you'll understand something of the frustration of the Ascended Masters. You'll understand the frustration of the mighty Christ, Jesus himself, and how he walked along, and a group of women came to him, and they started to weep because he was carrying this heavy cross. And they wept, and they wept, and they wept, and buckets of tears. The Master turned to them, and he said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and your children. And this is the whole situation that we have to understand. It's not a matter of shedding buckets of tears for the masters or for those who are on the higher road. You take the high road and I'll take the low road, people say. Well, those who've taken the higher road are the masters. And if you get on that road, you'll be with the masters. But there's all kinds of people on the low road. But they need freedom too. And they need the light you have to give. And if they don't receive it, remember they didn't receive him. But you still have to give your light. You still have to obtain your own freedom. What are you going to do? Stagnate? Become a vegetable until you rot away? No. You're going to get into the arena of action if you pursue the path that Master Moria himself has pursued. And when you're in the arena of action, you're going to vitalize not only this activity, you're going to vitalize our nation, America. You're going to help America to understand the meaning of freedom by enshrining freedom in your own heart. And this is the fulfillment of the new order of the ages. This is the fulfillment of the great capstone of the pyramid. This is the ceiling of the triangle of life's perfection within the heart of man. It is the engraving of the laws of God in your heart and in your mind. And you, when you do this, will be doing the will of God. And you will strengthen yourself. You will be a pillar and tower of strength to the world. You will be a pillar and tower of strength to your community, to your family, to your home, and to your God. And you will find that you will become, above all things, an electrode of light. You know an antenna is the end of the radio system and in communication communi come you and I into action communication the antenna which is the end of the system radiates out the light and that's your job that's my job that's our job. Let us do it and praise God for it. Thank you.